Good morning. It's good to see you. I'm Huey Davis, the pastor at Birmingham First. We're so glad that you're here on site and you're watching online. We pray this morning that the Lord would just fall upon us. We would sense his presence. We would know his will. And we would worship in a way like no other created being can do. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, for this opportunity to be in your house. To join together with believers who are looking forward to hearing from you. Father, we know there are people who are watching, and we pray, Lord God, that you would just rest beside them today, speak to their hearts. It is our desire that we would know you in truth, we would sense your love, and that you would hear our praise. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's go to him in worship this morning. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer.
Well, we're glad you're with us this morning. Let's turn our attentions to the word of the Lord as we're working towards uh, Pentecost. We've been praying that the Lord would guide and instruct us as a church. And uh, in the meantime, what should we be doing? Well, today I want to talk to you about heaps and stones. Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Uh, you either are or you are not one of these people. By a show of hands, you, went, you could go back to your home where you were raised, and there are marks on the door frames of where you were measured and named and dated. Anyone? Thank you, Jeff. God bless you. I thank you that you're here today, and there's a sole person that lived like that. Well, there goes a tremendous illustration that is now worthless. How many people put a bumper sticker on their car? You, anybody here with me today? A bumper sticker? God bless you, Sammy. We're glad you're here today. None of you have a cross, a fish on your car? God bless you, uh, Connie. Thank you so much. Whatever. Most normal people like to put stuff to show stuff that's happened. Most people like to make a recording of what they do. We leave behind photographs. We leave behind our collection of Elvis plates. They're going to go through the roof someday. Some of you have these. I know you do. We like to leave behind heaps and stones. We like memorials. Uh, we leave behind all kind of markers to say that we were here or that this happened. Nancy and I got into a habit of taking a rock from where we would go someplace and would have a rock. Uh, we did this in Yellowstone, not in a national forest because that, a national park, because that would be wrong. You're not supposed to do that. But nearby, we would take a stone, as I remember it at this moment, and we would take a stone. So we had uh, six people in this car, and uh, it was a minivan, and Nancy said she wanted a stone. I think I told you the story. But when we got home, she had collected four more stones. Now, you're saying, oh, how big is a stone? No, these were like two arms. You had to carry them with two arms. I couldn't believe it. We had these in our garden for a long time, and when it came time to move, she said, well, we're taking the rocks. And a discussion occurred about taking the rocks. We, we like to mark things like that. Our refrigerator is full of magnets, not full, but on the front door has all types of magnets that indicate places. From time to time, I like to separate them from the fun times and the okay times. We have heaps and stones that we have. We get this from our ancestors. In Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, listen to the story. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan... The Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and, ha and to carry them over with you, and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you in the future when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So you know the story, they're going to cross the river on dry ground. They're headed towards the promised land at last. And they take the 12 stones, one for each tribe, and they place them as the memorial so that when the children say, hey, what are the stones for? They're able to say, this is what the Lord has done for the people of Israel. So there is this importance of heaps and stones throughout the Old Testament. Story after story of where God has directed people or, or, or on their own, they made heaps and stones. I'll give you an example. Uh, so that they might remember, they did these things. 
which implies that there is a need to remember. Hold that thought. So, sometimes they did these heaps and stones as instruction. Uh, Jacob stops for the night, chooses a stone, puts it under his head so that he has a, a pillow, and during the night, he has a vision where there is a stairway to heaven, and he sees the Lord God, and the Lord God instructs him on his future. And so, he calls this place the house of God, and he takes that stone that he used for a pillow, and he pours oil on it, and he consecrates it, and he sets it aside to always remind him that here at the house of God, he had seen and been with God, and that God had told him about his future. And in that future, God says, your descendants will be as many as the dust. Now, I don't, I'm not a big duster. I never have been a big duster. I don't like dust. But can you imagine the number of descendants that are described by dust? You've been down a dirt road and the dust cloud behind you. Can, can, that imagery just really hit me. That, that, that's a lot of people. And so Joshua is instructed by God, and he puts this stone here. And then there's another place where Jacob and Laban, his father-in-law, who cheated him, much like he cheated his father, Isaac. You remember that story too? And he works so long and he gets, um, he gets Leah when he wanted Rachel. And he has to work longer to get Rachel. And one day he says, enough of this. And he takes off without telling anybody. And they take, and you know how fast those caravan moves, you know, like three miles a day or whatever, because it's a lot of people. And Laban comes after him and says, you have taken my children. Why have you taken my children? And they get in this long discussion. And what happens in Genesis 31 is they gather stones and make a heap of stones and says, this is between us. And what is between us is you have my daughters and you will treat them right. It's from where we get the word mitzvah. And so like our Old Testament ancestors, We also build memorials with heaps and stones to mark the significant events in our lives. Some heaps and stones are national markers, like the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, and Washington's Monument. These have been raised up to remind us specifically of things that have happened that we should never forget. But I would also tell you that some heaps and stones are kingdom markers. For example, we are forgiven to mark a new life. Our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, we don't, we don't see that now, but one day we'll see that where our name has been written down. There is an invisible marker that we have been invisible to us now that our names have been recorded in heaven. We're baptized to mark our salvation, an outward sign of an inward happening. It's a visible marker. We were dunked, we were poured, we were sprinkled. However, we've been baptized, and that marks us. We joined the church to mark our witness. And it used to be your name was written down in a journal. And now it's just typed into on a keyboard into a spreadsheet, which I find so much more uh, fascinating to work with. I want them to know everybody that lives in Irondale. Well, then I just alphabetize and look at the eyes. I need to find everybody that joined this year. Do one of those queries, and it shows you everything. But it's a, a visible marker. It's a heap and stone for us. So then what I would ask you is, what kind of markers do you have in your life? Now, what I mean by this is, you remember they said, when the children ask, what, what does this mean? That really is applying to us as well. For you see, those, those things that have happened in your life, the good and the bad and the ugly, God wants you to mark those because he has a plan for those things. I may have told you the story, but it, it bears repeating. Uh, one uh, Sunday, we were in church, and um, we talked about many, many things. And a lady came up to me afterwards and said, you were talking about 
witnessing and sharing our stories and stuff, she said, I just want you to know that if you ever have anybody that is contemplating an abortion, have them come and talk to me. <laughs> now, this person was not the kind of person to say, oh, I bet she's had like 20 of them. I mean, this was just one of the saints of the church, one of the, the pillars of the church, and they said this to me, and it was all I could do to say, get out. I mean, this, I mean, I was just stupefied. I was stunned that she had said this. But she had had this tragic thing happen in her life, and God was now going to use it in a positive way. So you have something maybe not near as drastic as that in your life, but God's going to say at you at some point, I need you to share that story. There's going to be somebody that comes to you. They're going to come to you and say, you know what? My spouse has left me, and I don't know what to do. And some of us can say to that person, let me tell you how the Lord took care of me when that happened. Somebody can say, you know, we had, this, uh, we had cancer in our family, and, and this is all that went on, and this is all that's going on, and I just need someone to talk to. And you're going to be able to say, let me tell you how the Lord helped us when cancer hit my family, how cancer hit me. There, just all those heaps and stones that you don't really think about in a spiritual way, God has the desire that you would take those things and that you would use them for his kingdom. This pillar, this stone, this heap of stones, so that when people see you and they say, can you tell me about this in your life? You're able to say, this is what the Lord did for me, what he did for us. And when we're talking about sharing our faith, so often the enemy would tell us, you're not an evangelist. You don't have the skills and training. You certainly haven't spent three years with Jesus, walking with him and hearing him preach and teach and healing the sick. Listen, you are, we are all evangelists because we all have a story to share of how we came to Christ. And our stories don't have to match because the world is not like us. The world is so totally different. And where you have been placed is where God wants to place you. He has you there for a very specific reason. Um, I, I've just, throughout my 38 years, have heard people say stuff and have somebody say to them, well, what did you do? What did you do? And they're able to share with this person how God led them through some calamity through some tragedy through some bad play some bad way and that person comes to Christ because they have they realize that what they have had happen to them happens to more than just them and if God can take care of this person during that time he certainly can take care of me the children walk by the stones and say what do these stones mean and that is our opportunity to say to this person here's what that means let me tell you how you're going to help me. When someone says to you, how could God allow this? They're wanting to hear how God could make this right in their life. When you tell somebody, I went through a really bad time. I'm a cancer survivor of five years. They're wanting to hear how could you go through that because they're going through something like that. So what kind of markers do you have in your life? Th those good times or those bad times? And how is God wanting to use those times in your life, in the lives of the people around you? We all have a story to tell. We all have an encounter with Christ that other people need to hear about. You know, as we work on our, our projects, finding a friend to share Christ with, uh, finding a family to share Christ with. Finding a, an acquaintance to find Christ with. So, you know, if I'm calling you and challenging you to do this, then this is something I have to be doing. So, Mother's Day, right after church, Nancy informs me that she has bought some flowers and cards for uh, a restaurant that I often go to, and she's, we're taking these things down there. She said, will that be Okay. I said, yeah, that's sharing the good news. That, that is a, a beautiful sentiment and a good thing to do. So those are families that we have reached out to. This week, I sat in a restaurant, had a guy 
come in, sit next to me. We were at a counter. Actually, he was, he was getting a to-go order, and he said something. And the Lord said, here's how you need to just talk to this person. And that's exactly what I did. Now, what happened, I have no idea. I, I'm, not, I'm not responsible for the results. You understand that, right? You're not responsible for the results. That's the Holy Spirit's job. God can certainly take care of that part. But what he needed was me to say, well, here's what happened in my life. Now, how he acts or responds to that, I don't know. I may never know. But I tell you this, you, we have got to be sharing our faith. And I, and I talked to you last week about the problem that we're having is a loss of hope in our communities, in the lives of young people, and, and they're looking all over for hope. But we have the hope. We're the only ones that have the genuine hope. Now, I don't know. I, I think the next big thing is going to be monkeypox. I don't know what the symptoms are, but I know it involves bananas, okay? But this whole monkeypox thing, it, there's three cases, I think, in the United States, and so we need to get all worked up about this. The world, you don't even know what monkeypox is, do you? Well, if you just had some a device that could connect to a worldwide um, informational system, Monkeypox is something that comes from anyone, anyone? Monkeys, and now it has transferred over to human beings, and it causes blisters and uh, a craving. No, it doesn't. So uh, forget the banana thing. Okay, so anyway, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be real serious. It's going to be real serious. Listen, our world, our government does not thrive on hope. Newspapers don't sell ads based on good news. The clickbait you find on the internet is never, let me tell you how things are going really well. It's always something that will cause you to say, well, how bad is it going to be? What, how's that going to affect me? So, we have the hope. And I say it like that to emphasize there is no other hope for our world. There is no other hope out there. We have the hope. And it is our job as believers, as witnesses, to share the hope with all that we can. So these markers that you have in your life, do you recognize them? Have you thought about them? Do you have a 20-second explanation of them that you can give to other people? You know what they call in the, the entertainment uh, industry, they call them elevator pitches. So you go from the fifth floor to the first floor, you got that 20 seconds, that 30 seconds. Can you tell me a story in 30 seconds? We should all have elevator pitches about how we came to Christ or how we endured cancer or how we went through a divorce or how we went through this rough financial time. We should have those things that we can give. You should practice it at home. I know that sounds crazy. But you should practice that at home. You should practice that on Wednesday night when we have Bible study. Let me share with you how I came to Christ as I was going through this bad period of my life. And then for 20, 30 seconds, give it to us. Don't give us the three-volume set over a period of weeks, but can you just, just break it down? That's something you have to think about. But I challenge you to do that because there are people out there, out there who are desperate to hear the hope that we share. These markers, can others see them in you? Do they recognize the heap of stones that have happened in your life? When they point to them, are you able to say, when they ask, what does this mean? Can you give them that story? You know, as we work towards Pentecost, which is another marker in the Christian church, birthday of the church, the great day of Pentecost when God's Holy Spirit fell upon the believers. As we work towards that day, as we are praying, we need to be ever actively engaged in our community, in our sphere of influence, with the people who are under the influence of um, our being in their web, the people that you come across, the people that you run into. We need to be doing these things. The challenge, find a friend and share your faith. Find a family 
and share your faith with them. And then find an acquaintance, somebody you don't know real well, somebody that you run into, and share your faith with them. Let's continue to do this, that we might be purveyors of hope. We have the one thing that everybody needs. And as we pray this morning, I just encourage you to ask the Lord to give you those names, to put those people's faces in front of you, to remind you of the heaps and stones that are a part of your life, and be willing to say to him, yes, Lord, use me in these things. Let's worship him as we work towards our time of prayer. Heavenly Father, your children call to you this morning. We are encouraged to be reminded that you hear us when we call. We're encouraged this morning to be reminded that you know our name. You know our situation. Father, we glorify your holy name. We're so thankful that you have visited us this morning. We don't take that for granted. We pray today, Father, that you would just speak our name in that voice that we recognize as yours, that you would attend to our needs, that you would speak to our trouble, that you would release your resources to cover our situations. Father, we really do want to be your witnesses. We pray that you just draw across our minds the faces of the people that you have put us in their in their web. You've put us in proximity to them so that we might speak of your love to them, the hope that we have because of your son. Father, there are families that you would have us speak to. Remind us when we're around them that we might share our story with them. Father, remind us of the heaps and stones of our lives, things that were difficult the things that hurt, even the things of joy, that we might share those events with the people around us. That when they ask about these stones that we have in our lives, we might witness for you. 
Father, we pray for the church of the Nazarene. We ask that you would continue to speak to us. Father, we want to be one of your churches. We want to be one of the groups of faith that speak accurately about you. Who live lives of obedience to you. Help us, we pray, in these days of confusion, in these days of questioning. May we stand for you and speak for you because we draw close to you. Father, we pray today that you would be with our homebound. We pray that you'd be with those that are sick, those that are awaiting tests and procedures and surgeries, that you would be with them and would care for them. As they call on your name this morning, wherever they're at, that uh, you might speak to them and remind them of your love. Father, we pray your continued protection upon this campus. We ask that you'd be with us, that as we minister to people, that we might make a difference in their lives. Father, we're already thinking about July 4th, and we pray your protection upon our campus for that evening, that you'd give us opportunities to share our stories with people, that this would be more than just a place to come and watch the pretty fireworks, but a place where they might come and worship and find a place of service and of hope. Father, we pray for peace in our world. And Father, we ask that we might not give our total attention to everything that comes down the, the pipe, but we would just be reminded that you are in control of this world and that everything that goes on has to first pass through your love and grace and mercy. Father, bless those that are watching. Bless those that are here in attendance today. May this be a day of Sabbath for all of us, we pray. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, it is good to see you this morning. Glad that you're watching. So good to know that uh, we can gather together. Here's my contact information. If you need to get a hold of me, feel free to do so through those numbers or through that uh, uh, um, email address. Our offering plate is in the back, and we appreciate uh, your faithfulness and your giving. Uh, we're looking at replacing the Family Life Center roof. It's going to cost uh, a little more than $10. So um, if you've got a check for, I don't know, $85,000, I want to drop that in the offering plate. Just feel free to do that, or you can do it through e uh, PayPal, or you can do that uh, through the mail. Be praying with us that we can find a, oh, these are terrible words I'm getting ready to say, a good, reputable, honest roofer who will do the work and help stop our problem over there, okay? Uh, gym night is Tuesday night. The kids will be here. What are we having for dinner? Tacos. Taco Tuesday? Well, it'll be Taco Tuesday, so we invite you to be here at 6 o'clock. Uh, we interact with the, uh, the guys, and we'll be playing pickleball and doing all kind of other stuff, so we'd like for you to be here. Wednesday night is our, first of all, is our prayer meeting at 5.30 here in the uh, sanctuary, and then we uh, gravitate towards the uh, fellowship hall at uh, 6 o'clock. We're in the book of Romans, chapter 6. It's been a very good study. We encourage you to be there and be a part of that. I'm continuing to ask you to pray for the half million mobilization, for renewal and resurgence in the life of the church of the Nazarene across the world, the two, uh, two and a half million members, the 5,000 or more churches. We just are really seeking the Lord, which is a great thing to do from top to bottom. I would like to invite you to our next second Saturday Supper Club. It will be on the 11th of June at the home of Jerry and Vernon Lowry at their uh, lake house on Lake Logan Martin. I just got through all of that really good. I, yeah, I know. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, no. Please hold your applause to the end, please. But so I got it all correct this year. I got it all correct. So we're going to go over there. Jerry, what time are we going to start? Eight in the morning? What? Eleven? Well, I thought we had breakfast. All right, so we'll get there late morning, around 11. Eight, nine? <laughs> so last, time, last year was exceptional. We had a great time. Vernon, you have time to build a 
pickleball court out there. I'm just saying. One court. Yeah, pickleball court. You could do that. So um, we'll, we'll, I'll have some people that will help you. So we're going to do all kind of fun stuff, fun games, and we invite you to be a part of that. And if you didn't go, we just have great food, great fellowship. We ride around on the boat and wave at everybody. We swam in the lake. Some people went fishing. A couple people went on the jet ski. I mean, just all kind of good stuff to go on, okay? And everybody bought good food. Oh, it was really good. So we want you to be a part of that. And uh, put that, mark that down on your calendars. It's June 11th, okay? From 11 to... <laughs> well, not everybody had a good time. Unless it was... So that should be a lot of fun, okay? So we hope you'll be a part of that. Um, I'd like to read together our Apostles' Creed. Here's our statement of faith today. Here's what we believe. Read it with me. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let me pray for you before we go. Father, I ask now that you'd be with all who have gathered, all who have watched, that this would be a day of rest for them, a day when they would sense your presence, your love, and would be encouraged by you. Father, this will draw us out into a week which we're going to be your witnesses. So we pray that you'd help us to be attentive to the nudging of your Holy Spirit. That you would lead us to people who are longing for you. And that our words would open a desire in their heart to be your children. Go with us now, we pray, Lord Jesus, for we ask these things in your name. Amen. God bless you, and you're dismissed this morning.